Welcome back for our next keynote of the day, titled The Resilient School. Our speaker is Mr. Nandan Nilekani, co-founder of Emphasis and AXTEP Foundation. And the session will be moderated by Mr. Ashish Thavan. Mr. Ashish Thavan is co-founder of Hoshoko University. He co-founded Chris Capital, one of India's leading private equity firms in 1999 and has served on the company's board since its founding. He left his full-time position at Chris Capital in 2012 after 20 years in the investment management sector to found Central Square Foundation or CSF, a grant-making organization and policy think tank focused on transforming the quality of school education in India. Ashish's passion for education has led him to spearhead the founding of Ashoka University, but he also serves on the board of several education nonprofits, including the Akanksha Foundation, the 321 Education Foundation, Teach for India, Center for Civil Society, Janagraha, the India School Leadership Institute, and the Bharti Foundation. Ashish holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Yale and Harvard. Over to you, Ashish, for this eagerly awaited session. Thank you, Ali. Uh, it's a, an honor to have Nandan as part of Ashoka University's Future of Schools Conference. Uh, Nandan is one of the, the makers of modern India of 21st century India. He's been a personal inspiration for me. Um, he is not just an entrepreneur, but he's been a public servant. He has, uh, you know, is a man of ideas. He's authored books. Uh, he's a leading philanthropist. Uh, and all of you know uh, that he is the founder of uh, Infosys, one of the founders, and he currently chairs the board as non-executive chairman. He is, uh, as Ali mentioned, uh, he was working in government uh, and uh, uh, is the, essentially the father of the, the Aadhaar project. Uh, and I think importantly for India, he's put India on the map. If you look at uh, new areas like digital identity, payments, digital empowerment. Uh, these ideas are borrow being borrowed by the rest of the world, uh, thanks to many of Nandan's ideas and, and initiatives that the government of India has taken up. I'm most excited about the fact that uh, Rohini, Nandan's wife, and he uh, came together to set up Ek Step Foundation. Uh, and uh, they're bringing their ideas around societal platforms to impact education at scale. Uh, Sal this morning talked about 100 million learners. Uh, I think Nandan is even more uh, ambitious. And, uh, and so it's a, an absolute pleasure to have him here. Uh, we'd uh, uh, all look forward to being inspired by him. Uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. So thank you, Nandan, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Ashesh. It's really a great honor and privilege to be at this Ashoka University event on future of schools. Uh, in a short span of time, Ashoka has really created a terrific university in India, and it's a pleasure for me to be associated, associated with you and your programs. Uh, today, I'll speak about uh, the resilient school and uh, what does it mean uh, for us? I think it's really about how do we get education excellence in a seismic era. I know all of you who are on this call are facing tremendous challenges as school principals, as teachers, as parents to deal with this unprecedented uh, situation. And I'll try to, in the next half an hour, talk about how we could think about the future in a way that we can get a grip on what is going on. Now, we, I think none of us were or are prepared for this disruption. The scale is unprecedented. It's not limited to a country or a region. It affects the whole of India and the whole of the world. So there's no part of the world which has not been affected by the COVID crisis. The speed is also something we cannot fully comprehend. Uh, just as early as Early May, March, we were not thinking about this, and now this is uh, preoccupying us all the time. We already have 2.3 lakh cases in India, 6.7 million globally. And what makes it even more difficult for us 
is that this is growing at an exponential pace. It's not going linearly. We can deal with linear things, but something happening exponentially is very difficult for us to comprehend. And that's why it makes it all the more difficult. It also is affecting all our aspects and behaviors. It's a crisis that affects everybody. It's a crisis that affects us at the personal level, the way we live, the people we meet, the way we socialize, the way we stay at home. It affects us in a profession, whether we are business people or we are teachers, our profession is affected, our institutions are affected, our schools are not able to function, the restaurants are shut down, companies are working from home. And so it's both a professional and a personal crisis for everyone. And it's something which we are not able to fully wrap our hands around. Every day we get new information about therapeutics, about vaccines, about treatments, all those things. But I don't think we are that much wiser than we were when this crisis began. So every aspect of our world is beginning to uh, deal with, uh, is unable to deal with this. Samaj, society has challenges dealing with this and parents are nervous about exams. Parents are nervous about next, uh, you know, what's gonna happen next year. Our companies, many companies are hurting, their revenues have gone to zero, especially if they were in the travel, hospitality or tourism business. Government is trying to cope with this in as much as it can. And as I said, markets are also uh, feeling the pressure. So everyone is struggling to respond to this unprecedented disruption. Now, it, what's also important to understand is that we did not really anticipate a crisis of this magnitude. Look at where we are. You know, currently, the actions of the pandemic are being done under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. This was a law passed by India on December 26, 2005. And this law was a response to the tsunami, which happened exactly a year earlier on December 26, 2004. And you will notice, if you go back and read the act, it talks about the affected area. So it assumes that the disaster will be in a part of the country in a particular city or a particular region. And this was all good in an era when you were dealing with tsunamis, earthquakes, cyclones, and other natural or man-made disasters. But here we have, and in all those situations, since the problem was limited to one area, you could rapidly coordinate and bring all the resources to bear. But here we have something which affects everyone and we are bound by the need to be physically isolated. We also are unable to mobilize all the resources because of the economic challenges this creates in terms of businesses going down, governments having to spend large amounts of money increasing the fiscal deficit. And most importantly, unlike other disasters which have a specific time, we can fix the cyclone impact, you can fix the tsunami impact, here, we don't exactly know how long this will go on, and we must be prepared to coexist with this for maybe many years. And therefore, the domino effects of this will be felt over many years. So this is a new reality. This is not a dream from which, bad dream from which we're going to wake up in a few days. This is the new reality. And therefore, when we think about school and education, we need to go back to fundamentals and reimagine it. We have to revisit the basics by saying the classroom is not the only location. We have to look at the constraints of teaching and be able to say that teacher is not the only facilitator. We need to have parents and others being part of the process. And we have to have new choices that it's not just about textbooks, but other means of giving structured information to a child. And all this means that we have to fundamentally reimagine things. While I think all of you have done a great job in responding in the short term by 
having Zoom classes and whatnot, this response is necessary but not sufficient. And we really have to think strategically on how we are going to deal with this on an ongoing basis in the next couple of years. Now, what is a resilient system? A resilient system is something which continues to function even when there is tre tremendous turbulence outside. It's like the ship sailing in a stormy sea. And resilience has to be thought through. It's not about, a, a lot of our time has been spent in making things efficient. But it's not about just in time, it's also just in case. Dealing with things and dealing with things which we could not anticipate. I was talking to a few corporate leaders about the business continuity planning they had done. And most of them had done very detailed business planning, uh, continuity planning, but it was more towards, again, earthquakes and uh, tsunamis and so forth. And very few of them, uh, nobody really had done uh, disaster planning for a pandemic. And yet some companies have been able to deal with this. For example, at Infosys, Infosys has 240,000 employees in 40 countries. And within two weeks, they were able to get 93% of them working from home. And the reason is because their networks, their security, their tech infrastructure, their apps made it possible. Even though a pandemic was not foreseen, the basic fundamental resilience enabled them to continue functioning at more than 90%. So we have to think of our education and schools in the same way. How can we reimagine our schools to function effectively while coexisting with COVID-19 for the next year or two? So what does school as a resilient platform mean? First of all, how do we ensure that learning continues even if the school is shut down? In other words, how can schooling be decoupled from the physical school? Is there a way to deliver schooling in different ways, digitally and physically? Secondly, how do we ensure when there is no physical interaction, often between the child and the parent, the teacher, how do we ensure that every teaching moment, whether it's with a teacher or a, or a parent or a neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, tuition teacher or whatever, how does that inspire trust? Which also means that the role of teachers will change because many of the things that we think about delivering like content and worksheets and assessments will all get standardized. And the teacher will have to deliver something more than that, deliver empathy, deliver the ability to deal with different children and their different learning speeds be mentoring them, evangelizing them, building up confidence and self-esteem. So I think the quality of learning and teaching will also change. And finally, how do we make sure that we have inclusivity? How do we make sure that everyone has access to learning? It's not just the people with the smartphones, it's people with no phones, it's people who have no technology. How do we make sure that everybody has access to learning and learning inclusivity is very important. When we designed the payment system, we were very clear that we had to make sure the payment system delivered payments in India to a billion people, which is why the payment system has a way for people with smartphones to use payments and something like 300 million people have smartphones and they use the UPI platform, which has more than 100 million users. And they use that to pay using whatever app they have on the phone. It could be Google Pay, WhatsApp Pay, Paytm, Phone Pay, whatever. And there are people with feature phones, another 300 million, who can also use UPI on their phones. And then we have another 300 million people who don't have phones, but who do have an other number and have opened a bank account using the Aadhaar EKYC. And they can also use payments by using just their Aadhaar number and their bank account, going to a merchant or a business correspondent 
and digitally activating their account. And today, the platform called Aadhaar Enabled Payment System, which allows people without phones to go to a BC to withdraw money, just in the month of April, at the peak of the lockdown, did 400 million transactions for 150 million people, which means 150 million Indians across the country could go to a BC and withdraw money from their bank account. And they did it 400 million times. And that was an, again an example of a resilient system which delivered payments even in the lockdown. And that again shows the need to design systems to be inclusive so that everybody is part of that. And therefore, any school as a resilient platform has to address incl uh, inclusivity. Now, the first requirement of this resilient school is to virtualize space. Schooling should be possible anywhere, which means just like today, working from home has become a standard in so many companies uh, in, in the IT sector, in the financial sector, in many, many sectors, wherever the work is possible to do from uh, anywhere, from home, it is being done. We have to think of schooling beyond the school. The schooling could be delivered at home. It could be delivered in a neighborhood uh, center. Some kind of it could be delivered at a CSC. How do we make sure that schooling is delivered not just in the physical school, but beyond anywhere? Which also means that we need to extend learning beyond the classroom. So it's not just about sitting in the classroom and accessing the teacher. It's no longer about proximity. How do we make sure that we have learning available everywhere, wherever you are, uh, and you have access to the same learning that you would have got uh, through the uh, classroom? And then it has to be extend both the physical and the digital. For example, you could be play, normally you'd be playing in the uh, uh, play, playground of the school. Tomorrow you'll be playing in your village but the school should know that you're playing there. And therefore, we have the need to synchronize teaching learning experiences. In other words, the school has to think of the teaching learning experience, not just inside it, but anywhere that they're delivering the learning. And they need to synchronize that so they get the same outcomes of teachers and learning experiences so that children are able to learn as effectively in this virtualized space as they could in the school. The second thing is virtualizing time, which means you, you, don't, you cannot be bound by the number of hours you are going to a school. You should have open access anytime, every time, on-demand teaching, on-demand learning. Now, on-demand learning is certainly possible in a self-service mode through technology, but you want it even in the physical world. On-demand teaching may require you to structure times when children have access to teachers even beyond the regular hours or some way or the other. And therefore, you should be able to really make it much more uh, flexible and usable. You also need to ensure that you can do both synchronous and asynchronous uh, interactions. For example, People sitting in, a, children sitting in the class is an example of a synchronous interaction. But children sitting at home and doing homework and submitting the homework next morning is an example of asynchronous interaction. And all our activities are requiring us to combine the synchronous and the asynchronous. For example, in companies, we do uh, video calls using Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams. And that's a synchronous activity where a bunch of people get together and do a meeting, which is virtual. But we also use email and other, other things where we send messages and expect the reply next morning. So we need to figure out how the learning process also has this combination of efficient coordination between uh, uh, people, teachers, students, parents, and have efficient interactions. And we have to make sure that we provide this both across online and offline. 
it's not just about smartphones. It's not just about digital. It's also about inclusion and making sure that people who are offline have access to the learning. So you should learn anytime, anywhere, and through any channel. And therefore, we need to be able to, the, the resilient school of the future, future will have to orchestrate these teaching learning processes to combine this anytime, anywhere, synchronous, asynchronous, offline, online, and still deliver a holistic experience. And then finally, we have to virtualize assets. Assets could be anything. It could be uh, the uh, the content we have. It could be the the time uh, the, the 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 learning learning pattern we have. It could be assessments. It could be worksheets. This could be done at a board level, at an individual grade, or for a subject, or for a language. You should be able to modularize by decomposing or deconstructing your existing activities into different categories. And we have to reimagine our content. We have to make sure that content is abundant and affordable because content cannot be a monopoly or content cannot be limited to a few. And therefore content should be available to everyone at high quality and accessible globally. So it's very important to demonopolize quality content. And finally, we need to have some ecosystems that can rapidly use this data and, 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 and learn from each other. You know, for example, if, if uh, there are 50 schools in the CBSC system doing something, they can all get together. Each of them has tried a new experiment and they can learn from each other. And this fundamental disruption that we have is making us far more open to this kind of rapid change. And therefore, by learning from this deconstructing and then putting it back together, we can recombine teaching learning experiences. Now, in this world of the resilient school, the typical schedule for a child may be quite different. One day he may be at home doing online live sessions or self-study using offline materials by printing the worksheet from the nearest CSC. The next day, he could be at school doing physical discussions or lab work. The third day, he could be at a sports center. The fourth day, he's back at home doing self-study online. The fifth day, he's back at school. And again, the sixth day, he's at an activity center. So even when we get some semblance of normalcy back in the when the COVID thing is finally managed, we still think that you need to think of schooling not in the old day of going across five days to school, but having this kind of variation. But the school is still able to synchronize and orchestrate these learning experiences. And we have to deliver this digitally and physically. We have to deliver this at a personal level, at a shared level. So digital shared infrastructure would be a movie screen or a community TV. A shared physical one could be a post office or a village center. A personal digital could be an app or your radio and a personal physical could be your textbook or worksheet. So you should be able to do all this across the whole uh, dimension and you need to use universal language of things like QR code to interconnect and interoperate across this whole, all these four dimensions, personal and shared and digital and physical. And therefore we need to deliver inclusive learning across all these aspects. And this becomes very important and we need to have the kind of railroads for making this happen. And that's what a resilient school will need. So when we talk about technology, we are not talking about just digitization. We are not talking about ed tech. We are, talking about, we are not talking about how to make the horse cart go faster. We are reimagining transportation as not as a faster horse cart, but as a car. And similarly, 
we are thinking about, we need to think about how to apply learning, amplify learning with technology. In other words, that learning still remains paramount and how do we amplify it with technology? So it's really reimagining because we live in a world where change is happening exponentially thanks to COVID. And now we need to think of a response which is also exponential and not a linear tactical response. We also have to look at both quality and equity of learning. How do we make sure that everybody has access to learning and the same quality? I'll give you some of the lessons we learned doing Aadhaar and payments. We looked at five angles. First is universality, which means that everybody should get access. And I gave you the example of the payment system where everybody, whether they have a phone or a no phone, gets access to payments. We have to think that population scale, the solutions we have to think about need to be able to operate for 300 million children. It's not about one school or two schools. It's about how do we, an entire society is able to navigate and move forward. We have to think about portability. For example, in the Aadhaar enabled payment system, you can go to any BC and withdraw your money. And that becomes a choice for the person. So it doesn't have to go to the next city or something. You can just go to a neighborhood Kirana store to withdraw money. So portability becomes very important. You need to have convenience. In the school of the future, we need to have convenience. In Aadhaar, we designed it so you got enrollment anytime you wanted. So you didn't have to go back to your village. You could go to Sunday evening to Aadhaar Center and do your enrollment in 15 minutes. And finally, you need to have choice. So children and the parents must have the choice of choosing the schools and, and so on. And therefore, the schools that are better able to respond to this will be able to deal with it better. And what it really means is it requires a unified response. This is too big for each one of us individually to do it. It's too big for governments to do it alone. It's too big for NGOs to do it alone. It's too big for markets to do it alone. This will require Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar coming together, giving a unified response. And as I said, we cannot be keep on responding to this tactically. We must get ahead of the curve. And we have to be prepared for the fact that lockdown cycles are going to continue. This is, we, sh we should not, we, 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 we need to realize that even if we do open schools, it's entirely possible that after a few weeks, if there is an outbreak of cases, then again, you will close the schools. And you may be in this mode of switching on and off the schooling system for a year or two. We also have to think about new responsibilities. Obviously, we need to orchestrate the physical and the digital. We also need to orchestrate the school and home. I know so many parents who are now finding it extremely difficult on top of doing the work housework by themselves, on top of working from home, on, they have to also make sure the children's education is taken care of. So how do we balance responsibilities between school and home, between teachers and parents? So this whole thing is changing the uh, role and responsibilities of all of us. And most importantly, we have to get to rapid implementation. We don't have uh, time. We don't have plenty of years to sort this out. We need to do it very, very quickly. We should be able to deconstruct and recombine, reuse, repurpose, take ideas from one part. We have to increase the velocity of innovation in the way we do things. And that means, that's what we mean by saying, reimagine every school as a resilient system. And therefore, it's not about building again and again. It's about building beyond. And today and yesterday, you would have heard about Diksha from uh, Ms. Anita Karwal, who is the school education, primary school uh, secretary to the government of India. And Diksha is an example of a national platform where the digital infrastructure is rolled out in every state, 
Every textbook has QR codes. And while it is a digital infrastructure, many solutions are possible on that because different schools will have different priorities. Different regions will have different priorities. Different states will have different priorities. And therefore, your ability to be flexible and agile, but using the digital infrastructure to accelerate becomes very important. And I think there is a panel right, on, uh, right after this, which is going to get into detail into Diksha. And Diksha reflects many of the ideas that I have talked today. And it, it is required, it is an example of how we can build in resilience uh, in the system. Another example is something else that the government has launched called Vidya Dan, where content can be contributed by people. And if, if we really want to quickly build a great content library, then we, can, we, we have to get people also to contribute. And that's what we are, Vidya Dan is all about. Again, they'll talk about that in the next panel. So we know that our children are resilient. They are able to deal with most difficult situations. Today, we have children who are in migrant children who have no place to go. You have refugees, who, yet these children are managing. Our children are the most resilient, but we adults often tend to be structured in our thinking, but we owe them a better future in this most unprecedented time. And therefore we need to think about how do we rise to the occasion and think ahead of the curve and deliver the resilience that we owe them? So, and we have no time to waste. This is not going to be waiting for us. And today is the best day to make our schools resilient. Today we start, we need to start now. Fortunately, India is in a much better place just like we invested in digital identity for a billion people, payments for a billion people, just like we implemented uh, all the various national infrastructure. We now have educational infrastructure which has the same scale and resilience that we need. And I suggest we all go for, for it right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nandan, for a very inspiring and uh, thought-provoking session for our school leaders. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of questions, so I'll jump straight into it because we have under 15 minutes. Uh, you talked about this idea of anytime, anywhere, sort of omni-channel uh, access to uh, essentially modular resources that are demonopolized, de rapid innovation. Um, so it sounds like you're talking about a very learner-centric uh, environment, and given that you've... Uh, you know, uh, thought a lot about digital identity, digital empowerment. Can you talk about how, you know, we can take those ideas and bring them into school education? How, make, how do we make it more learner-centric? How do we track individual children, create pathways for learning uh, that sure. are unique to each child? Yes, absolutely. I, I think, first of all, uh, as I said, we cannot limit ourselves only to people who have access to phones. Because that is not, uh, you know, in India, if you have a billion people, one third will have smartphones, one third will have feature phones, and one third will have no phones. And therefore, they are actually the poor and the most vulnerable. They are the ones in the government schools. They are the ones who are most disadvantaged. So we have to make sure that anything we do keeps takes into account uh, everybody. So the inclusion is very important. And that's the lesson that we learned from Aadhaar and payments, that it has to be inclusive. Before Aadhaar came along, there was no ID system for a billion people. I mean, maybe 50 million people had a PAN number and 150 million people had a, uh, had a, had a driver's license, maybe 30 million people had a passport. It's a very, very small part of the population. So how do we make sure everybody gets it? So I think that's, very, that's one thing that you learn when you design at population scale is how do we make it universal? And that's something which we have tried to do uh, with the thinking that we have in Diksha and all that. How do we make sure every last child gets access? For example, when my wife Rohini had gone to Gachiroli, she went, which is a remote uh, tribal part of Maharashtra, which has, you know, Naxal infested and so on. She went to a remote school in remote Gachiroli, and there she found Maharashtra state government textbooks, which had the QR code, which meant that they were ready for use uh, in, a, in a digitally empowered way. So I think. That's important. And also, I think, in trying to make sure that 
each child has different learning patterns each child has different uh, abilities some children have disabilities some people are better at languages some people are better at numeracy how do we make sure that we individualize this is very important and that again is very much built into the infrastructure that we have and the deconstruction and innovation is very important i mean today for example and they will i think talk about in the panel that each uh, state is doing different innovations tamil nadu is doing one kind of innovation up is doing another kind of innovation if they are to meet and share the innovation they will all marvel at what the other state has done and because it's built on a common railroad it's very easy for one group to take the other group's idea so this ability to so increasing the velocity of ideas and innovation is very much required in this kind of an infrastructure and nandan you've talked uh, repeatedly about inclusion uh, and ensuring that the last child does not get left behind a lot of what you talked about the uh, digital tools etc uh, people one of the school leaders was asking sort of almost assumes that somebody has access to either a smartphone or a feature phone how would this get delivered to households that don't have access to these devices so i think uh, one is we have to use our physical infrastructure for example uh, uh, people have may not have a device but they are close to some kind of a digital service center you know so called uh, customer service cscs and so on yeah those people have devices those people have printers so they you can actually print out suppose you are doing a particular course you can print out the worksheets there so they the worksheets can be delivered to the children they can fill out the worksheets the worksheet can be uploaded back to the center so they they will have the same thing except instead of doing it physically on a device they have a printed worksheet so in fact some they are doing some similar thing himachal is doing this they are actually yeah. printing out worksheets and sending them to schools and getting them back a week later so we have to innovate in all this there's no there's no choice we don't have a choice this is going to be a, a situation that's going to be there for a, a year or two we are not going to be able to predict its ups and downs we are not able to predict schools opening they may open and go back we we have to think out of the box and we have to think boldly because tactical small things are not going to work and, and london you talked about you know virtual assets uh, the ability for schools to contribute different assets whether it's worksheets videos other things innovative practices that they're doing apart from the content which uh, is at the heart of vidya dan i mean how do you envision building communities of schools or or learning circles as it were because so far essentially all the knowledge has been trapped either in a classroom or at the level of a school and we really haven't had communities of schools learning with each other well i mean let's let's take example so many of the schools today and the teachers and principals are from cbse schools and cbse schools now have all the textbooks and crt textbooks which are qr coded now they can all contribute content they can all contribute worksheets they can all contribute questions uh, some may have discovered a particular uh, a hard spot in education they may have come up with a technique to solve it in their school they can share that and other schools can use the same technique so there's lots and lots of ways to share things but you see when you share you need to have a common language of sharing you need a common railroad i mean think of a idea as simple as time you know time is only a 3000 4000 year idea when when the first sundials were invented and sundials defined daytime and nighttime and it's only about 500 years since we had really small, very really precise clocks about so it is because we have a concept of time that you can announce that you have this particular session at 11:30 on saturday the 6th and people from all over the world can sign up so we have a common language of time similarly once we have a common railroad of the way we do content the way we do tests the way we do questions the way we do assessment and all that is available then the sharing also becomes much faster yeah. and and then there's another question around how we can reimagine teacher development by using technology and these tools yes i think i think teacher development is uh, going to be critical and i really greatly admire our teachers today they are working under very difficult circumstances and still managing to deliver learning to the young children they are dealing with 
first of all i think a lot of the standard stuff will get delivered automatically so you know content will be available widely assessment will be available widely uh, question banks will be there you know so those kind of delivery and content will become streamlined and all that but what you can't take away is the teachers mentoring a teachers empathy a teachers ability to gauge how much a child has learned a teachers ability to gauge self confidence so i think a lot of teacher training that we need to do is really address these aspects for teachers because the role of the teacher will move from delivering content to being a mentor and and uh, hand holder for children both physically and remotely and this will require different skills which i am very confident that our teachers will be able to uh, develop and they already have that and they can further hone it and nandan there's another question around uh, you know how do we ensure apart from the academic learning you know the socio emotional skill building takes place people have also asked about co curricular activities you know music sports etc i mean uh, you talked about this idea of you know the the week and different days but beyond that can technology play some role uh, as well or do we just have to rely on the humans to make that happen no 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 i, I think social capital is very important and uh, uh, no amount of technology takes away the need for social capital even today when companies are looking at working they are working almost 100% from home but they don't expect that to be the steady state when things start getting better uh, you know ultimately about whenever the vaccine comes and so on they're looking at something like two thirds in the office and one third from home and everybody comes at least two days a week and works at home three days a week because social capital our social interactions our conversations our serendipity these are all required very much and especially so for children so i do believe that once we come to steady state while we'll have complete we'll have amplified our ability to learn and teach coming to school physically will very much be part of it social activities community activities sports activities will be very much required as an integral part of the future we may have challenges in the short term but that's definitely required in the medium to long term so nandan we only have 3 minutes so i thought i'll just do a quick rapid fire of some of the last few questions so i can cover more what should be the number one priority for school education in india right now reimagining re it and getting ahead of the curve with the kind of ideas we talked about today what does government need to do regulators in terms of formulating policies i i would say that governments are actually ahead many of the things i talked about are being done by the school education department anita karwal spoke to yesterday diksha is actually a government initiative and in some sense government is ahead we need to partner with them and take it even further so how can it companies in india play a bigger role in enabling this and making this happen well it companies can provide money from the csr they can provide content they can do it through philanthropy i think the many many ways they can have. they can provide volunteers uh, to go and uh, do technical teaching i think and many of them are doing that i know that many uh, education is often the first priority of csr for corporates in india and where do you see us in 2025 and 2030 what are targets that you have in mind well my view is that this this continuity is forcing rapid change and if we are able to get ahead of the curve then actually in some sense this discontinuity is going to accelerate our goal of having every child in school and learning and getting prepared for the future great thank you so much nandan really Thanks. appreciate your time thanks ashish thank you thank you